Today's NICU nugget is on the two most common types of birth injuries, a caput succedaneum, which I'm very proud I said that word, but from now on I'm calling it a kappa, and a cephalohematoma. They are both injuries to the head, and they both mostly occur as the baby is being born through the vaginal canal. So you can imagine that anything that increases the level of trauma as the baby is going through the vaginal canal is going to increase the frequency and the severity of both of the birth injuries. So for example, if the mother's been pushing for a really long time, if it's a really big baby, or if the baby has an unusual presentation. So for example, if the baby comes out kind of sunny side up, so the face is pointing to the ceiling as the baby's being born. Also, if the OB needed to use forceps or a vacuum to get the baby out, then obviously that's also going to increase the risk of having any type of injury to the head. People get really muddled up between caput and cephalohematomas, but it's very easy to remember because a caput is like a cap in that it crosses suture lines, and the suture lines are the gaps between the skull plates. So the reason why the caput crosses the suture lines is because the swelling, or the collection of the serosanguinous fluid, is in the connective tissue right below the scalp, so really very superior. And there are no distinct margins, nothing stops the spreading of that fluid within the connective tissue, so you end up with this like boggy mass of the caput with very undefined borders. So caputs are mostly on the vertex of the head, like the highest part of the head, just like a cap, um, and they're present at birth and they generally go away within one to two days. They're not really associated with any anomalies. A cephalohematoma, however, is a deeper collection under the skin. In fact, it's normally accumulation of blood underneath the periosteum, and the periosteum is a thick blanket of tissue that covers the skull. So the blood collects between the periosteum and the skull. So you can imagine that it's a very well-defined space that therefore does not cross suture lines. Trauma at birth normally causes bleeding in the space, and the bleeding can continue after birth. So as opposed to the caput, which is already big at birth and generally gets slower progressively afterwards, the cephalohematoma can continue to grow after birth and can take days or weeks or sometimes even months to completely resolve. The parietal bones, so these kind of bones on both sides of the head, are the most common sites of injury for the cephalohematoma. And as you can imagine, because it is a deeper injury, it takes a little bit more trauma to get a cephalohematoma as opposed to a caput. So cephalohematomas are more likely to be associated with other complications. For example, about 5% of them can be associated with a skull fracture. They can also end up with more extensive bleeding, so you can end up with some anemia, as well as, therefore, hyperbilirubinemia. And then sometimes, very rarely, that area can even get infected. As they resolve, most of them just get absorbed and the blood gets kind of sucked back into the body. But sometimes, very rarely, that area can get calcified and you end up with this cosmetic issue. So, in summary, a caput is like a cap. It crosses suture lines, it's more superficial, and it's not associated with any anomalies. A cephalohematoma is deeper, it does not cross suture lines, and it's more likely to be associated with complications. Thank you, I hope you learned something. Please subscribe if you want to hear all these other brilliant NICU talks. Thank you, bye.